Bandwidth for This Week in Startups provided by liquidweb.com. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Use the code TWIST7 when signing up to save 10%. And by GoToMeeting. Sign up for GoToMeeting and use the promo code START for your free 30-day trial. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups, and we're finally having one of my favorite entrepreneurs on the program. Trip Adler founded Scribd. Uh, in 2007 and has grown it to 100 million users a month. It's a pretty incredible story. He was in one of the first Y Combinator classes back when Y Combinator was based in Boston, and we're going to hear about his five-year journey and everything he's learned. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey everybody, we're back. It's This Week in Startups, and uh, boy, do we have a great episode for you today. Uh, with me is Trip Adler, the founder, or I should say co-founder and CEO of Scribd. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Great uh, to be here. Five-year journey for you. Yes. Part of the Y Combinator uh, class, I guess it was the second one. 2006, yeah. And that was in Boston. Boston, summer 2006, yeah. Wow. And yeah. how many people were in that class? There are about eight to ten companies. Yeah. Eight to ten companies. Now you see, wow, it's like 70 in the last one or 80? Yeah, there's, there's, I think, three that are still around or in some form. There's wow. there's us, Zobni, and then OMG Pop, which is Right, of course. Yeah. yeah, wow. Uh, well, we're going to get into that, and we're going to get into growing a business from zero to 100 million people a month. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, I want to tell everybody about Squarespace. Squarespace, uh, this is a service I use for launch and all the conferences to build websites you know, you can get like a free service like uh, Blogger or Tumblr, and then there's like paying somebody to build your website, and then there's this great new product in between those. Um, not $3,000 to pay somebody on Craigslist who doesn't return phone calls, not free, and there's nobody to call for support. But right in between, Squarespace. It looks even better than those people you pay two or $3,000 for, and it's a high-scale service, and they're giving 10% off to everybody uh, who is in our audience. Just use the code... Twist7, T-W-I-S-T-7, as in This Week in Startups, 7. And if you buy for the year, they'll give you a free domain name and they'll give you 20% off, which brings it down to like, I don't know, five or six bucks a month. It's incredibly affordable. I think they charge too little for the service and it is gorgeous. So you have all those people in your family. I'm starting a small business. I've got a 20-person business, a 10-person business. Maybe you've got somebody who's a freelancer. I'm a Java programmer. I'm a photographer. I'm a freelance editor. You need to have a beautiful website that features your work and that's going to stay up and running, and that's high quality, and that's what Squarespace is. That's why I use it. That's why a lot of my friends use it. Um, I absolutely stand behind the product. I've been a user for a number of years, and I know the team over there, and they're aces, and they keep adding beautiful, beautiful uh, content uh, and services. So it's, it's never ending. You can always find new templates and great design, and you don't have to call somebody. You know, it's very frustrating for some of your family members. They got a website, you set it up for them, or a friend set it up for them, and then, oh, I want to add a gallery. Oh, I want to add a Twitter page. Oh, I want to add this page. I want to add a message board. I want to add a blog. And then they got to call you, and oh, it's another $500, another $1,000. You got to get the, who got the FTP login? All that nonsense goes away. Squarespace is easy to use, and they can make those changes themselves. They can literally change the design in the template. It's gorgeous. It would be like if somebody built a CMS from the ground up. If, if Steve Jobs created a gorgeous content management system, that would be Squarespace. That's how good looking it is and gorgeous. Um, and you know, I have my choice of who gets to sponsor the program. I'm very lucky that way. And Squarespace, it was in my top 10 list of products I love. We contacted them. They said, of course, we'd love to sponsor the program. We'd love to start uh, sponsor and support entrepreneurship. Uh, and we've had a great partnership for a number of years. So thank you at Squarespace. And if you're a fan of the show, just say thank you at Squarespace uh, on your Twitter account or your Facebook or your Google Plus or your Rise. Friendster, uh, Pounce, any of those social networks. I don't know if some of those are still around, but thank you, Squarespace. So, Trip, um, what an incredible journey you've had. Let's start with how you got to the idea for Scribd, because correct me if I'm wrong, I think you had about 75 ideas and pivots mm-hmm. in the first year of this company mm-hmm. in Y Combinator. You got into Y Combinator mm-hmm. with what idea? So, so it's actually more complicated than that. We went through several ideas before Y Combinator, okay. and then several so, ideas after Y Combinator. This is before. at the Harvard dorm. Yeah, it was. 
the year after Zuck left? Uh, or right around the it same time? It was about that year. So I was in, in Zuckerberg's class. The, the you were the same year? The same year, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did you know him? Uh, I did knew not him? know Zuckerberg at Harvard. I've gotten to know him since then. Ah. Um, I knew a number of the other co-founders, yeah. though. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I knew several of them. I actually, I, I remember um, seeing them leaving, leaving campus. I remember they were packing up their bags to come out to California. So that was, that you remember was, literally seeing them I literally to go seeing to the them airport. with their bags, yeah, outside Kirkland House. So. And what was that saw, like? Were you like, wow, I there. need to do that. Um, I, I definitely crossed my mind. A little I was, jealous? Like... I was, well, I was still focused on becoming a doctor back then. Ah. So I was thinking pretty differently about my life at the time. I was, I was uh, a few months away from taking the MCAT. So wow. I was planning on becoming a doctor um, like my dad and like a lot right. of people in my family. Um, and then I was, uh, I was, at the time, I did want to start a company. So I was thinking I'd start a biotech company or something in the, in the healthcare space. Um, and then it wasn't until a year or two later that I, I decided to, I guess, pivot my career path into right. the internet space. How was that conversation with Dad? Dad, uh, I'm not going to be a doctor like it, you. It, I'm going to start an <laughs> internet company like Zuck. <laughs> I, I think I think it went it went fine. I mean, he he's an entrepreneur too. An entrepreneur too. He started a uh, med tech company oh, called okay. Accure that went went public yeah. a few years ago. And so. you grew up in the valley, so yeah. So this is your DNA. Yeah, I mean, I've been very comfortable with startups. My, my or you know, I've been familiar with the concept of startups my whole life. So he was very supportive. I so think. what were the first couple of ideas um, that led to Y Combinator and Scribd? Yeah, so the I, I guess the first time I really had an entrepreneurial idea, which I, I think is, um, you know, it, the, the, you, I think most entrepreneurs remember the first time they have sure. an idea, right? Because yeah. when you're young, you don't really have any ideas, and then you have one idea, and even if it's a bad idea, you're really excited about it, right? Yeah, it's like your first um, love. Yeah, it, it's kind of like that. Yeah. First girl you kissed. Yeah. Which was? Um, what was her first I, name? I, I think I remember that less than. Uh, oh really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I can tell you, it was Andrea. Yeah. I can tell uh, you okay. where it was. It was in St. from School, between the old school and the new school building is on that, steps. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Absolutely true. Really? Hi, Andrea. Somebody's okay. going to forward the story. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in another, another conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the first idea I had was for a, a ride-sharing service. So oh, okay. um, I actually think the, what I was thinking of would be a pretty good idea in, in a few years from now. Right. Um, but at the time, it was basically, it was going to be kind of like a peer-to-peer version of what Uber is today. So right. the idea Which is, is Sidecar. I just took it yesterday. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So keep it's, going. it's starting to happen. So, yeah. So the idea is that um, you would use your cell phone and your location to coordinate a ride with someone going in the same direction as you, and then you'd yeah. have payments built in just like Uber. Carpooling, and yeah. It's a, it's a really cool idea, but I think we were about 10 years too early, because back then you couldn't, you couldn't do anything with location. Mobile phones with didn't mobile have payments. maps. They didn't have anything, yeah. Right, I think at the time, so, well, I don't think mobile phones at the time had GPS it, in no. 2007. I don't think 2006, that time frame, yeah, they had GPS. Had those Some Nokia of them phones. had maps, but you yeah. had to download and update your maps, and you didn't know where you were on the map. Exactly, yeah. Slightly different. Yes. Um, so you, you, how did you know that idea was bad? Just the phones, the technology wasn't ready. So I, I guess I realized that idea was bad when Paul Graham told me it was bad. So, so uh, in retrospect, I think um, uh, I, I learned that... Uh, that you know, if you're going to start a company, it has to uh, be technically possible yeah. at the time. Um, but the way I learned those bad ideas, we we applied to uh, Y Combinator with that idea, and Paul Graham just in the interview told us it wasn't a good idea. So that was when we moved on to our next idea. Um, and uh, how did you find out about Y Combinator, by the way? Because back then, yeah. I, you, like you said, about 10 people in that first class. I don't know. In the second class, I don't know how many in the first. Was that like all the rage in 2006 and 2007 on Harvard's campus, or was this just like some weird guy in a room who was trying to give startups five grand. So, so it, wasn't, it wasn't quite like that. I think, uh, I think Paul had a pretty good vision for yeah. the future, which has played out quite nicely. Oh, um, incredibly so, yeah. So, so yeah, at, at the time, um, I, I actually didn't know about it. It was yeah. my, my co-founder, Jared. So, sure. so getting started, I was working with this other guy named Jared who I met The at CTO of Scrib. The Scrib. CTO, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, uh, he had been following Paul Graham for quite a while, and ah. when we want to start this company, he suggested we apply to Y Combinator, and I originally wasn't too excited about the idea, because they, they, uh, they described Y Combinator as a program, and I remember I said to my co-founder, uh, do you think Steve Jobs started Apple within a program? Right. Uh, so I didn't really like that idea, but... Um, Most people thought, and, and, and Paul has proven them wrong, that good companies didn't come out of accelerators, that yes. accelerators for, were for weak companies. Boy, has he it's, proved them wrong, huh? Well, it's for for people who aren't uh, you know aren't ready to get past that first step, right? right? So it helps a lot of people get get into the game so that they can then then build right. a great company. 
Right. Um, but why had, I mean, a lot of people did share this belief, and I actually thought it originally because I had seen uh, incubators in Web 1.0 fail terribly, mm-hmm. and it seemed like strong entrepreneurs didn't, weren't attracted to going to an incubator and giving away 6 or 7% for a small mm-hmm. amount of money, and, well, who's this guy? I don't, you know, I, I don't know that I need to take advice from somebody. Like you said, Bill Gates mm-hmm. wouldn't do it um, in that era. What did uh, Paul get right? He got something so right that it turned out he did attract great people, where mm-hmm. everybody thought if you had to go to an incubator, you were a loser. He didn't get he, far from it. He got winners. How did he do that, do you think, in your estimation? Um, what was it about so it that drew I, I such think high quality people? I going to have uh, different answers. So, yeah. so while I was skeptical of Y Combinator at first, I've, I've right. come to appreciate it very much. And uh, what I like about it uh, is primarily the community. Mm. Right, because when you when you start a company, it, it's kind of it's kind of lonely, right? And and Very. there isn't, uh, and, and at least before there weren't many people to learn from, right? Now when you start a company with a Y Combinator, you're doing it um, with a bunch of other people, and you're all learning from each other. Right. Um, and it's just a great it's a great experience to learn from each other. Uh, I think that the the competition and peer pressure is actually kind of good, yeah. um, especially your your first time, just seeing your friends moving faster than you and realizing you have to move faster to to keep up. I think that that's just a, a good atmosphere. Um, and then, and then, um, in the end, I think that that community has become just a, you know, an important part of of our startup lives, right? I mean, right. many of my best friends now are people who I, you know, were at Y Combinator about the same time as us. Um, so all of the companies from the early days of Y Combinator that are still around, I mean, those are those are the the people who I still tend to bounce ideas off of and and hang out with. Um, so, so in my opinion, it's it's that community is the main thing. Um, I think also just uh, if you're a, if you're a first time entrepreneur, it really helps uh, helps you just get get going. What was um, so unique about Facebook was that it got incredible traction within Harvard, and then as soon as they opened it up to the next school, which I believe was Stanford, all of Stanford was using it within two weeks, right? Because right. everyone just invited their friends, and it just spread. Right. Know anybody school, at Stanford? School. Boom! Everybody yeah. knows somebody. Whereas I'm selling. You know this old uh, computer. Yeah. Oh, you're in Stanford. How am I going to get it exactly. to you? It, there's yeah. no natural exactly. like connection. So we had this idea that we would go from from school to school mm-hmm. and within Boston, but it was just too difficult. There wasn't anything really viral about it. Mm. Interesting. Um, and so when did you pull the plug on that? Uh, I'd say about October of that year. So we worked on it all summer, launched it in September when school started, and then about a month later we pulled the plug. Did they have a demo day back then? They did, yeah. 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 And so how many people were at the demo day and how did they uh, respond to it? Not not quite as many people. Yeah, we were we were kind of the underdog in the class yeah. actually. Uh, people were like, oh, that's yeah. kind of a derivative idea yeah. and it just seems kind of boring. Exactly. So I remember, uh, you know, everybody What was notes, that like? Uh, you know, to have like the underdog and like, uh, that's kind of a cheesy um, idea. It definitely, uh, I mean, it's it's definitely not fun to be underdog. It burns Everybody, you a little bit? It, it, it burns you a little bit. I mean, especially when you're, you know, most of your friends from school are going on to get really great jobs, you're going on to grad school, and you're you're starting this website called Who List that's not really working. You know, it's not it's not that fun. But I think that... And you're a competitive guy. Uh, I don't think so. Competitive. I'm competitive with myself. Yeah, competitive yeah. with yourself. Like you're like I, one of those I, tennis player guys. I yeah. Who I like I gotta I, get my serve faster or something. Yeah, I I, I like to continually improve and keep learning things. I mean right. that's something I, I enjoy doing. But I think if, if you're competing with other people, that gives you the wrong incentives, right? Right. But you just said you're seeing all your friends go on to other great things. I mean that did tweak you a little bit. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But, you didn't feel like you were keeping up. But uh, I, I didn't. But at the same time, uh, that was. Uh, it was. I, I thought of it as an experimental year at the time. I, I didn't think it was that. Imp- it would be okay to spend a year kind of trying some things and seeing right. seeing what what happens. So right. So I was okay with it. So then, now you're with a website that doesn't work. You didn't get angel investing. I take it. Um, not for that idea. Not no. idea. Yeah. So how do you wind up? Then you went from ride sharing to who list. Yeah. Then what? So, so we actually tried a number of other ideas too, and they range from just coming up with the idea to playing it out to, in some cases, even building it and trying it. Right. And uh, you know, those those days that it felt like a, a frustrating time, and that we were trying so many different things and failing. How many? Give, give me the ten second version of each. 
Uh, okay, well, let's see. There was so, one that was a phone number, right? Like you call, okay, and, and they, there was they, one about... Yeah, yeah, I remember... So I, I actually thought that was a, a really cool idea. What was that? It one? was uh, at least codenamed uh, 1-800-ASK-TRIP. Right. And the idea is you just call a number and you ask whatever question you want and then somebody answers it. Did, so doesn't like, Google have that product It's now? like human-powered search over phones. Exactly. It's uh, like Quora over phones. It, kind I mean, of, tell yeah. me and... There's yeah. a lot of 411 services, by the way, in yeah. Europe that do very well with this. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a, it was a good idea. I mean, it could have built a great company, but um, I, I think we foresaw that that iPhones were going to come out soon, and pretty soon you'd be able to just actually do all this through. You a could get bar, the so. address yeah. of the sushi bar. Exactly. Yeah. You wouldn't have to call someone. So, yes. So we didn't want to be on a trend that was dying, and we wanted to be on a, on a growing trend. So that's why we did decide not to do that one. Um, and then we. Uh, we inspired by Hulis not being very viral. We tried a site called Moobub, and uh, Moobub. Yeah. Okay. So what is, is Moobub? That, so, so we want to take the opposite of of the the Hulis approach and and do something that would be as viral as it could possibly be. So we want the to most viral service ever designed. That, that was pretty much the idea. Go. Um, except there was nothing clever about it. It was okay. just that it was going to be really viral, and we were going to create virality for advertisers. So Got it. if you're an, an advertiser, you want to get a message out there virally, we would create a viral way to get that out. And we, we tried this over email. The idea is we were going to incentivize people to forward emails along. So it's basically ah, like multi level marketing. Chain emails as a service. Wow. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, we actually built Moobub. And uh, we had, uh, we had a, a logo. It was a, it was a cow. We, we did everything. And we, um, we, we, I, I sent this email to about 10 of my friends and was really excited to get them to forward along this email. And no one forwarded it along. So we decided that was, that was a bad idea. Ah. Yeah. So you get the product made. This is the opposite of Lean Startup. You actually built the product and well, then sent we, it. We built it, but it was a pretty simple product. Okay. Right? It was just a landing page and, a, and an email, right. Right, an email uh, address. So it was sort of lean. And yeah. you just knew that if my friends are not forwarding this and we, they're part of the target. Yeah. yeah. So then you pull the plug on idea number four. Yes. I think if I'm kind of And there's, and there's a bunch of other ideas. But, you know, like serious there. idea number four and then script, or do we have one more? Uh, I mean, there are lots of other ideas we discussed and, and thought about about doing it. Those are those are the ones that kind of stand out to me at the moment. Um, okay. I mean, there. Are, I mean, we tried all sorts of things. So, what um, was that? What what led you to then Scribd? I mean, so you're a year into the entrepreneur journey yeah. at this point. Yeah, about a year, and, yeah. and, I, and I'd say um, you know this this whole experience so far, it was a little bit frustrating to try and fail. But when when I look back on it, that was when I learned a lot of the the basics about how to build a company. Right? Um, it, it was through through each of these these things we tried and failed at. I, I think um, you know we learned certain lessons about how the internet works and mm-hmm. things that we eventually applied to Scrib, which made Scrib much more successful. Um, so you know through Hulis, we learned we needed a product that was going to be viral and was going right. to grow. Through uh, through 100 ask trip, we realized that we needed to be on a growing trend. Right. right? Um, through Moobub, we had we realized the, you know what Paul Graham taught us, which was that it had to be a product that people actually wanted. Right. Yeah. So um, so through each of these things, we we learned kind of uh, basics of of building companies, and then we were able to apply all of those lessons to Scribd, which led to Scribd ultimately being pretty pretty successful. Um, so uh, so how Scribd got started? So. Um, the, the original idea was from talking to my dad, who's a doctor at Stanford, yeah. and he had a medical paper that he wanted to uh, publish. And in, in medical publishing, just to get his paper out in front of the people he wants to read it takes about 18 months. Hmm. So uh, we thought, well, we can build a service that would let him more easily get this paper in front of his colleagues. Right. And then we realized that we could broaden that idea to, to, be, uh, to be much bigger. It could be for people publishing books, for people publishing their school papers, for people publishing any kind of written content. Um, so we, uh, we built a site that would let people take any kind of document in a PDF or Word or PowerPoint format, upload that to the web. We would convert it to a web page for them at the time using Flash. Yeah. And um, and that was pretty much the idea when it first launched. It was pretty simple. Um, so we we launched that on TechCrunch, and it, yep. it became pretty 2007 or 2008. March 2007, yeah. yeah. And it became pretty instantly successful. So the idea ended up being on the front page of Dig, which was huge at the time. Yeah. Front page of Reddit, which was a lot smaller at the time. Yep. Uh, front page of Delicious. Um, and uh, it just led to us getting... Enough, uh, enough early, um, early traffic that people came and uploaded a lot of content. And then that content started attracting visitors um, on its own. So 
the people would upload a piece of content, that piece of content would then go viral on Dig, or it would go viral through the, the blog. And at that time, you needed to have an FTP or somewhere to host something, a blog, yeah. or it was really difficult Flickr. To it was hard to put content. up a document. Exactly, yeah. Um, and it grew incredibly quickly. Yep. How many documents and users did you get in that first year? What was it like to scale it? Because at that time, yeah. were you on EC2? Was EC2 really like a viable option, or were you just doing this on your own servers? Yeah, we were one of the first companies to use S3 and EC2, yeah. so right. that, that helped us a lot. Um, and uh, at the time, the um, yeah, I would say, I remember the first few days, it was maybe 20, 30,000 registered users. So wow. back then, it was a lot harder to get registered users because you didn't have Facebook Connect. Or right. Twitter, we Connect, Twitter, yeah. Google so, Connect. None of those things existed. Yeah, yeah. So we were, we were one of the... Back then, there weren't as many of these overnight successes, right? Where, yeah. where sites would just go viral. Uh, we were one of the earlier sites to have a really explosive launch. So since then, it happens all the time, right? That's right. Like required to get your startup off the ground. Right. Um, but that that first launch really helped us get moving forward. And then uh, and then after that, I think we we entered a much slower period of growth, right? right? Where we weren't growing that quickly. And then it was and then we started to get the new viral mechanisms in place that allowed it to grow to the next level. Uh, when we get back from commercial, I want to talk about. Uh, all the issues at that time period about DMCA mm -hmm. and content and copyright, because you guys, like YouTube, mm -hmm. got caught up in that whole mm -hmm. confusion, I think, by a lot of copyright holders of how the DMCA worked, but you seem to have solved it, and mm -hmm. I want to hear how you solved it, sure. um, because you had been tagged with that for a long time, I think unfairly. Um, and uh, right now, I just want to thank at the GoToMeeting, which is the uh, software I use to take all my meetings. I do probably five, ten meetings a week on GoToMeeting. I hate using the free services out there because... You get what you pay for. You can never find the other person's handle. Screen sharing, video, all that stuff is ganky on these other services. But on GoToMeeting, it's flawless. I use it literally um, at least once a day on average. And it works on Mac, PC, iPad, Android, all these things. HD, screen sharing. You can even let somebody edit on your site. So I could load a Word document and you can edit on mine. Or if you had some obscure piece of software that doesn't have collaboration built into it, you can use actually GoToMeeting to do that. It works flawlessly, and you know you just get that nice little. You can tell somebody. You can tell a meeting's going to go well and start on time when somebody says, "Click this URL, type in this password, and that's it." You know, it's just going to work. And as opposed to you have to add somebody and then try to find the seven people who are supposed to be on the call. That never works. Um, and so, if you want to use GoToMeeting uh, and be an absolute professional, go to GoToMeeting.com and click the Try It Free button. And use the promo code START, S-T-A-R-T. That's really easy. You use GoToMeeting. Yes. Works. Great, great product. Perfectly. Yes. Flawlessly. Amazing. Yes. And that's, yeah. that's what you want in a, when you're actually doing an important meeting. I, I agree, yeah. Have the meeting start on time. Yeah, we use it every week for our company meetings. Right. And if you use one of the free services or whatever, like uh, it may or may not work mm -hmm. and it's just not stable and it's so affordable. Mm -hmm. So make sure you go check out uh, GoToMeeting. And if you want to thank them on your Twitter account, Thank at GoToMeeting.com. All right, so in 2007, 2008, um, there was a lot of talk about YouTube, mm -hmm. and you guys were paying as YouTube for documents. In fact, mm -hmm. I think that you called it that many times. We, we did, yeah. yeah. We, we don't still call, call ourselves that. Yes, but, we did but at the time, yeah. YouTube was the viral sensation of the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, then all of a sudden, YouTube gets dinged with, this is, you know, with billions of dollars in privacy, uh, I'm sorry, um, piracy, lawsuits, and by associating with them, I think mm -hmm. you probably had the same exact thing happen where you guys had a lot of people upload things that they didn't own, mm -hmm. even though it was very clear, do not upload anything you don't own. Mm -hmm. So your users you know, break the terms of service, and then the copyright holders hold you responsible. Mm -hmm. And how did you wind up dealing with that? Because there were lots of DMCAs at that time, lots mm -hmm. of lawsuits, but it seems to have all gone away. How did you manage that both... Legally, you know, and more operationally and optics-wise mm -hmm. with the people whose content was sometimes being uploaded by people who were breaking the law. And that's a pretty clear distinction. They were breaking the law, not you. Mm -hmm. How did you handle it? Must well, have been difficult um, as a first-time entrepreneur, right, to start uh, having lawsuits pile up? It was, it was, well, well, there weren't many lawsuits. Uh, it was... Um, so, so yeah, we, we didn't actually really see it coming, but we launched the site and immediately people started uploading content they didn't own the copyrights to. Right? Yeah. I mean, we started getting all sorts of uh, just, you know, books and magazines and things like that. And uh, um, I so, remember looking because I was fascinated by your traffic. 
because Mahalo was an SEO play, and I was looking at one of the services, I can tell you, like, the top pages, and I was like, oh, here's a bunch of Playboy magazines uploaded by somebody in Japan. And I was like, wow, Playboy magazines from 1960. Those are cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So people start doing stuff like that. Yeah, so you know, that was really never the original use case, right? right. The, 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 the use case we were envisioning was people actually sharing original, high-quality content. And... Uh, so, so the first thing we did was you know, we uh, we connected with Wilson Zini, and they just helped us. You great know, law get, firm. Yeah, they've been great. They helped us get uh, just covered legally and made sure we were complying with the DMCA. So we, you know, we started doing uh, just following the DMCA. So taking down documents as we're notified. Um, and uh, I guess at first it was just me doing that, and then actually one of our, our our very first hire was a person to handle that because it was pretty time consuming right from the beginning. Right. Um, so we had a full time person managing all the takedown requests and making sure we were taking down things as we were supposed to. Um, but the the real thing that helped us uh, make it a manageable situation was that we decided to go way bit above and beyond the DMCA and build a copyright filter. So what we would do is as soon as something was was taken down, we would would then store the full text of that document, and if ah. someone uploads the same thing, um, we would then uh, we would then immediately have that content removed. So if you try to upload ah. uh, a best-selling book, for example, you'll immediately get a a uh, notice that that says you can't upload. This. Yeah, you just uploaded um, the script to the social network. You cannot do that. Exactly. Yeah. Which happened? And, uh, At some I, point, somebody uploaded the script it? to the social network. Okay. Yeah, I remember TechCrunch running it. Like, I think they were like, "This okay. is the Facebook movie." And okay, yeah, okay. you guys took it down. <laughs> okay, we took it obviously. Down. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and and uh, so so that really really helped us just uh, manage the amount of, of content being uploaded pretty quickly. It's actually the same the same thing that YouTube does. So right. It worked quite well. Um, and then pattern and, recognition. Yeah, exactly. And then and then the the next step that we took was we were very proactive in partnering with publishers and 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 working with them to get their content up on our site legitimately. Right. Um, so um, as part of putting their content up legitimately, we also store all the content in our copyright filter proactively to make ah. sure it doesn't get uploaded. So with most of the big publishers, we have um, you know, the, the digital fingerprints of all of their content, and we just make sure that it, it never shows, shows up on the site. And since we have the digital fingerprint, you might want to sell it here. Um, yeah, so definitely it helps. It makes it, it kind of convenient, right? It, if it's, it's, uh, it's a whole package for publishers, yeah. right? We help them with the copyright protection, we help them with distributing their content, and we help them monetize it. Right. Um, and how do you deal with um, the sort of wacky people who blame you and actually think you guys are the ones doing the copyright infringement? Because that always happens. You get these sort of like fringe people who are always, always very loud and you know they might be like an independent author and they... I still believe that you're the person responsible. I mean, Viacom in the YouTube case would be that they just won't let it go, you know. And 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 how do you deal with that when you have those kind of folks? I mean, there there isn't too much of that. I, yeah. I think every site has the occasional uh, disgruntled user, and I mean, we we have a pretty big customer support team and go out of our way to do what we can for those users. Yeah. So one thing I notice, um, you're ranked whatever on Quantcast number one hundred or one hundred ten. Pretty impressive. I think it was. And then, I think it's top fifty. But oh, is it top fifty? In the U.S., it's top fifty. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe I was looking at the maybe global internationally. Right. It's yeah, maybe it's like, maybe that's what I saw. 50. Yeah. And I was drilling down. It's because I was drilling down to the numbers, and I noticed, my God, you have ninety million people outside the U.S. using the service, or ten million in the U.S., something like that. Um, nine to one ratio, or eight to one ratio, something. Mm-hmm. Um, is that by design, or is that just because people around the globe? just need this service and it's that easy to use? Do you have localized versions? Was that always part of the plan? Most of the websites in the United States yeah. get a third of their traffic or half their yeah. traffic internationally, yeah. not 90%. How did that happen? Well, I think that we we just built it in a way that it would just grow organically all over the yeah. world, right? So uh, so since our, our document viewing technology built in HTML5 supports pretty much every, every language, right? Uh, it just would, people in different countries would use it. Um, so I remember in the first few weeks we had uh, someone in Romania come and upload a few thousand Romanian documents, and ever since then we've been one of the top twenty or so websites in Romania. Um, you know, meanwhile uh, that's happened in just lots of countries around the world. So we we have a presence in pretty much every country. Um, we're actually it's actually really surprising to see how big we are in these countries. So I, uh, according to Quantcast, we're the number two quantified site in Brazil. 
Wow. So, uh, I mean, there's there's clearly other sites that are that are bigger that are not quantified, but right. um, I mean, there's a lot of countries we've gotten really big, and and it just it just sort of grew organically. So, we are just, you building organizations in those countries? Do you have people on the ground? Do you have international operations? We, we don't. We just uh, internationalize the text on the website. Wow. So, so all these users yeah. overseas, do you think, wow, maybe it's time to start reaching out to publishers in Brazil and then start making money there? And um, Yeah, we are. I mean, we're, we're expanding our publisher relationships all yeah. over. But in, in general, we, we still tend to be a mostly product and engineering focused company where we just mm. focus on building the product and let, the, let it grow organically. Right. So most of, our, most of our new users and publishers are still not... Uh, being formed by us going out and getting those those relationships, just people start using it. And um, how do you make money? So we have a uh, three-part business model. So uh, first part is ads. Um, just we have ads Google on the AdSense, site. AdSense, whatever. and other ad networks, and yeah. they're they're targeted based on the content in the document. Mm-hmm. So they're contextually related to the content. And also we have, our, our time on site is very high. People will spend a lot of time just reading through a long document. Sure. So we get a lot of ad impressions through, through, one, um, through one page view, effectively. Right. Um, so we have ads. Uh, we also have premium accounts. Um, so that's, that's another big chunk of the revenue. Why do people pay for a premium account? What's like the number one reason? Um, it's mostly you get um, ad-free experience. Ah. You get unlimited downloads, unlimited printing on the site. Got it. Yep. So if you want to go to the site and print and download, that's not a feature unless you're a premium member. It is for some content. It's, it, right. it depends on the content. Yeah, and how do you mark that? How do you delineate? All the older content is, is, um, is premium for printing and downloading. Got it. Yeah. So when something hits X age, it moves mm-hmm. into the premium section. Yep. Yeah, I think I remember. And that was a pretty clever innovation. How did you guys come up with that? Uh, I, it just uh, it's just a good way to uh, you know build a premium service, right? Yeah. Um, and and then the, the the third model that we have is uh, commerce. So we let people buy and sell content. Yeah, so we and work with a lot new, of publishers right? to help them sell their content. And and how is that going? I mean, I'm assuming advertising is the biggest part. Subscription is the second piece, and then this is the new piece, selling direct. It's how is that going? Going quite well. Yeah. So we we see that as the 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 biggest opportunity going forward. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we want to work with publishers and, and authors to help them make as much money as they can using our service. So, um, so, so we have like some, some, uh, some users, for example, uh, who are selling things like study guides, making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month selling wow. content. So we, we see that as a pretty big opportunity to scale up becoming a marketplace for content. Got it. So instead of me going to the Kindle store and selling or iBooks and getting approved by Apple. This is a sort of platform agnostic version of publishing. Um, um, where do you, who do you see your competitor it's, there it's, for, like, for the content producers? Well, I mean, we're not, we're not necessarily competing with iBooks or Amazon. It's just a, another way to distribute and make money off your content. And for certain types of content, like let's say it's study guides, uh, research reports, um, you know, uh, just short stories like that kind of content. There really isn't um, a great solution out there for selling that kind of content. Yeah. So, so we're you know we're just another alternative for that kind of content. So, I'm not like a, a major author right now. I'm not Stephen mm-hmm. King, but I would like to. I have a small fan base. I could sell a short story and maybe they'll, they'll buy it through this system as opposed to putting it on the Kindle or something. Yeah, Where I'm yeah, already on the yeah. Kindle, I'll make this my my web direct version. Yes. That I could put on my website kind of a thing. Yeah. And YouTube tried that too with like video on demand. It doesn't seem to have worked for them. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it do hasn't. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't followed. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and so five years into the business, how many people work there now? About 40. 40 people. Mm-hmm. One of the largest sites in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, how big can it grow? And have you sort of reached the ceiling? And are you sort of starting to think as an entrepreneur... This would be part of a bigger company. Like that must come up in year five or six. You're venture backed. They like to get their investments back at some point. Seven year seven, eight, or nine, probably. Um, is it decision making time for you guys to like decide to sell it, or is there some adjacent business you go into to to get to the next level, or can it keep growing? No, I think um, you know our our goal is you know while it started out just just simply as a way to publish piece content online. Um, I mean, we've, we've broadened what we're, we're our, our vision is quite a bit. And we want to do is we want to build an entire platform that allows content owners to 
publish and distribute and monetize their content, and then also at the same time build a great reading platform where you can come and read and discover and share content. Um, so I think what we've built is really just that first piece, and we mm. still have a long ways to go. So the, uh, the, you know, the, the commerce piece is really actually growing extremely quickly. So we see a lot of opportunity there to, to help uh, publishers of all kinds make more money through our service. Uh, um, and that's worked pretty well for, I guess, your closest competitor, DocStock, Jason Azar's company mm-hmm. down in SoCal, yep. uh, who we're all friendly with, has mm-hmm. been on the program. How do you guys compare to them? I mean, it seems like you guys launched, they launched shortly after you, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and they seem to have gone, like, let's do legal documents, let's do mm-hmm. certifications. Like, they're going hardcore business yep. to business. Mm-hmm. Um, is, uh, are they really like your closest competitor at this point? I mean, you guys are much I bigger in terms so. of size. We've we've um, we've gone our different ways. I mean, they've they've very much focused on the business, the small right. business use case, and also right. they're focused on creating content. Mm-hmm. We're still focused on very different verticals. I mean, education is our biggest use case. Um, you know, scientific publishing, uh, creative writing, um, very different use cases. And also, right. I mean, we're we're still very focused on becoming the platform for publishing and sharing this kind of content. So very different. Path right. we've taken. Yeah, they've gone business to business. You've gone platform. Even though you both started in the same place, which was just an open platform, YouTube for docs. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of ironic that you started as YouTube for docs, letting anybody do it, and now you've circled all the way back around and said, you know what, we have to become, so it was very user centric in a way, now it's, we have to become the advocate for these publishers and, and, and help them make money. Did you always mm-hmm. know that that's where it would wind up? Um, actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, we there's a, a a business plan we wrote actually before we started the company, uh, where we did outline that that business model where we wanted to go. So it's actually it's played out quite similarly to how we originally imagined. How has the publishing business changed in the last five years, in your estimation? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. these publishers seem to have so many more opportunities, yep. but then they also seem to be crying about how terrible their lives are. Which is it? I mean, is it a world of opportunity or is it a complete disaster for Random House or a scientific publisher, in your estimation? Um, no, I think, uh, I think that all these new platforms just create more opportunities for them, right? Mm-hmm. There's just more, more things that they can um, experiment with and more ways to make money. Um, so I think it just, it's just a different... Um, it's a different business for them. It's, yeah. it's changing a bit, but I, I've in general been very impressed with the publishers' abilities to adopt all these new these new channels, and yeah. we've had a great time working with them. It feels incredibly complex for them. I mean, they used to just send a manuscript to get printed, then they would do 2.0, the paperback, and then maybe 3.0, they would do another second edition with a different forward. Mm-hmm. Now, they have the iBook platform that came up from Apple. Mm-hmm. You have Kindle. Uh, you have apps as a way to publish. Mm-hmm. You have Scribd. I mean, you have a, a lot of different ways to get this content out there. Mm-hmm. Um, is yours going to be a tool that helps them manage that entire process? Do you see yourself as the posterist to take another Y Combinator company um, mm-hmm. of this, or maybe even Adobe in a way, when mm-hmm. you keep talking about the platform? Because it's getting pretty complex to manage publishing to four or five, six platforms, isn't it? Um, yeah, so I mean, we help simplify the process for them, um, right? I mean, uh, a lot of what we do is is help them distribute their content because you know the distribution channels are constantly changing. I mean, right. I'm sure as you know through Mahalo, just yeah. doing SEO yeah. is a really challenging thing, and it, the yeah. fact that we can help these publishers SEO their content and right. and help, and we've done built a lot of special technology to help the content get SEOed well is a real value add. Um, and it's not just SEO, it's also the, the social channels are constantly changing, right? right. Um, I mean, just making your content optimized to be shared on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, all these sites, is, is there's a lot of work behind that, and you have to constantly keep modifying things. Right. Um, also, uh, the mobile platforms, as you mentioned, keep changing. So, so, yeah, so we see ourselves as a role where we help them be able to constantly distribute their content. So we do a lot of that, that work for them, so they can just simply upload it. Yeah, and you guys got hit, uh, like us, by Panda. You seem to have recovered a little bit better than us. Mm -hmm. What's the secret to recovering from the Google Panda search algorithm hit? And when that happened, uh, February 24th or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking? Like, my God, we lost this double-digit amount of traffic. Was it it a little bit of panic inside the organization like ours? No. um, So, I mean, with us... I was in a complete panic. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, I think that... um, 
with with SEO, I think a lot of people think about SEO as you know it's like the the website owner versus Google, right? But right. that's that's really not the right way to think about it, right? Google Google's job is SEO is to just or with search quality is to help um, users find the highest quality content, and your job with SEO is to really do the same thing. Right. And Google just as the web changes, they need to change their search how they do search quality to help users find the best quality content. Right. So um, so I think on the SEO side, you just need to to always keep up with Google and keep helping them make these changes. Right. Um, so in our case, we just had to help you know, shape the way Google sees our site so that it can do a better job of finding the highest quality content on our site. Right. But it was a pretty brutal change to make on partners. I mean... Um, yeah, I think a lot of people didn't see it coming, right? They, yeah. And it was yeah. bigger than anything they'd ever done. I mean, it's pretty horrific. Um, it, it was a big change for them, yeah. yeah. I mean, usually their changes have been a lot smaller. So I think yeah. a lot of people didn't see it coming. And, and it is true, if you're, if you're a small company... Um, like like you know Mahalo or um, or any of these SEO driven companies, and they make yeah. one big change that takes away ninety percent of your con- your traffic. I mean that can yeah. that can kill your business, right? Yeah, we um, didn't quite die, but we got yeah. I mean, we well, you guys could have right, yeah. and you're you're going in a good new direction. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that you know, the trick is just make sure you're still producing high quality content, and you're helping yeah. Google find that content. Right. And as long as you do that, you're you're in good shape. Is Google a content company today? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, well, come on now. Don't be cool. I, I know it's no, hard. It's, it's not. Is it hard for you to talk about Google because so, you have a major Google dependency? Do you feel uncomfortable talking about them? Do you think no, that they... No. no? So what no, do you think? You... A content company or not? Give me the honest answer. I, I would say no. How, how are they a content company? Uh, well, what do you think? What are the things that would lead you to believe that they're a content company today? Um, Anything? I, what, Purchases Google, Google, Zagat. Google Books. I, what? Google Books. What is, Google Zagat. Google YouTube, Google I mean, funding YouTube's content. A platform, right? Well, I mean, but if you're funding the production of content now, mm-hmm. that sort of makes you more like a studio, doesn't it? Um, kind of. Yeah. I, oh, I, Zagat I, is kind I, of content, isn't it? They bought it, Google Zagat. Well, I mean, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a big company. They do a lot yeah. of things, right? Yeah. I know, but they said they would never be content. Those are definitively content, mm-hmm. and they pushed Yelp's results way down the page to put Google Local above it. Yeah, they now have a Wikipedia, Wikipedia style content box. Mm-hmm. They push um, Yahoo Finance and other Raging Bull down to put stock quotes above them. They push travel sites down to put their own ratings of hotels. They push stock prices down to put stock prices up there. Sports scores and sports sites down. So, mm-hmm. isn't it only a matter of time before they come up with their own script and push you down the page and it affects your business? Are you worried about that? Do you think about that? Um. I actually don't. I, yeah. I think I think Google. I mean, they're in a a challenging situation, right? right. Because they they need to uh, continue to provide good results to users. They need to keep website owners happy. They need to keep making money. So it's a tricky spot to be in. And um, I, I mean, people are going to give them a hard time, obviously, about the, what they yeah. do search results. And you know, I'm not I'm not super familiar with some of these examples like Yelp and how that really worked. I, I know I. I, I well, if you ever search not, for a local restaurant, yeah. You notice it's a Google local listing first, and then Sometimes. the search results I, I, come below it. Changes. I'm not really sure what determines yeah. the the order. Um, well, basically, they put their own search results on top, the Google yeah. local box, uh-huh. and then organic search starts after it. Yeah, yeah. Surely you must have seen this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, is that is that always how it works? I you, I often yeah, I see Yelp pretty... first too, right? No, hmm. no. If they if they've got the restaurant, they put their listing up first, hmm. not in okay. the organic results, but a map, you know, in that sort of content container. Hmm. Um, so the content container is being put above, I don't know what they call them, but the content container is being put above the organic results. You know, it would seem to me likely that they would at some point have their own mm-hmm. hosted version. I mean, they did yeah. do something called Knoll no, yeah, that did. didn't work. Yeah. When you saw that come out, did you think, hmm, that feels a little bit like Scribd, didn't it? It, it was a little competitive, but, uh, yeah. you know, it didn't. It I, died. I, I, well, I'm not sure they really put as much work into it as it yeah. needed to succeed, right? I mean, to build a, a large platform requires, you know, a lot of work and attention, and Google has a lot of things going on. Yeah, so. too many projects. Yeah, I think, I, and I think, you know, it seems to me like Google's doing a pretty good job of consolidating all those projects, or at least they're going in the right direction. Yeah, they are um, seeming to put more. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's tough to say. It's, you know. Um, so you glossed over decision-making time with the company, Surely you've had offers to buy the company. No successful company in the top 100 sites wouldn't have had an offer. Mm-hmm. So um, logic states you've turned down those offers since you're still an independent company. Mm-hmm. Why are you still an independent company? Why did you turn down? Um, 
multiple well, Can I ask purchases. you the same question? Uh, sure. Why are you guys an independent company? Uh, because I don't feel like we've succeeded, in, mm. and I feel I can keep growing it, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Yeah. Generally speaking, I mean, I mean, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I feel like there's, it's still challenging, and I feel like we're still growing. Hmm. So those would be the reasons. Yeah. Well, I, for me. I, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't say our reasons are, are that different. Um, I mean, really, our, our goal is to build, we, you know, we have a, yeah. a big, bold vision of something we want to build, and we're, we're steadily moving towards that vision. Um, and I think we, uh, you know, we, we still have a long ways to go. So, I mean, we would like to, to keep working at it. And, um, you know, for, for us, I think an exit is more about where that helps us get towards our vision than about the financial aspects of it, right? And Google if, would be the perfect purchaser of the company, having they, bought YouTube. It could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, well for us, if, if we found an acquirer who really had a, a you know, a, a, could really help us achieve our vision, I mean, that, that would be much more interesting than just selling the company to sell it, right? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, you know, for, for us, it's, it's more about what we're trying to achieve here than, than just the, the financial aspect. Yeah. So what's the most challenging thing today? Um, I mean, you guys mm-hmm. have had great success. Mm-hmm. Unqu- you know, th- th- no qualifier there. It's great success. Mm-hmm. What's you. hard now? What's hard? Um, I mean, it's got to get harder yeah. to get out of bed in year six and seven and know what to do now that you've had this great success, right? I mean, there's so many options for you guys. Yeah, you can well, go in so we many also directions. have so much more experience that that it, it gets easier in some ways, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think um, I, I think that just continuing to execute really well at this size gets a lot harder, right? I mean, in order yeah. to be really successful on the web these days, you need to be able to continually iterate and continually push really high quality products, and the 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 quality bar for products keeps getting higher and higher every year. Um, and just being able to maintain what you have and to keep up with that growth of the web is, is really hard. Um, and I think we're doing it pretty well, and I think we still, we still could do it better. And we just need to keep doing a good job of making our product as good as we possibly can and continually push it forward. I agree 100%. I think it's mm-hmm. a very astute observation that mm-hmm. everybody's getting better at making product. Yep. And so you can't just be as good as you were last year or else you're falling behind. You have to get better, yeah. You have to get better to stay the same. Mm-hmm. You have to get a lot better yep. to increase your lead. Yep. Um, and so h- how do you do that on a practical basis? I mean, how do you get better at product? you got the same team. What are your tips and strategies for other entrepreneurs watching to get the team to excellent, not just good? Because if you're, yep. if you're excellent today, that means next year you're going to be just good mm-hmm. with this attrition that occurs. Yep. Well, yeah, that's that's a good point. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, it it just starts with the team, right? Having the highest quality team is really important, um, and then it's it's giving the, the the team a good environment to work in, right? Yeah. And just having a good a good culture. I mean, those are yeah. kind of obvious rules of building companies. Um, you know, in, in terms of of process and way of thinking about product, I mean, we've we've actually changed the way we do this um, quite a bit. I mean, it's always changing. We we now do a lot more. Um, upfront um, thought and iteration in the design phase, um, mm. and we really think through what we're uh, what we're building, and we're 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 very careful about what we decide to build and how we decide to build it. More intentionality, perhaps. Uh, what, what What do you mean? More intentionality, like um, uh, yeah, like yeah, thinking I guess you... about what you're going to do as opposed to just like we should add this and then just you add it. Like um, thinking like we're going to add it and what are the different ways we can add it yeah. and why are we adding it and how does I'd it say, affect somebody's I'd say life? I we are getting more there, – yeah, there is more of that. But I, I think that might just be because we're – you know, we, we understand our business more savvy, much better yeah. and, you more know, we're, we're able to do that. So I think it's all – I mean, I, it's interesting uh, as a conversation because I feel like we're going through the same moment at Mahalo, which again is another mm-hmm. five-year-old startup that's had, I would say, moderate success. Um, and we're really trying to be much more intentional and mm-hmm. think about what we're building and why mm-hmm. and how to make it excellent mm-hmm. and what is excellent yep. and defining excellent. Mm-hmm. And then also, do you have the team members who can make excellent product? Mm-hmm. Um, if we are, in fact, in this age of excellence and everybody's getting better, if you have somebody who's doing a good job, that actually is not enough to compete today, is it? Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it's it's uh, it's really competitive. It's more competitive than ever. And and now, I mean, now they also have these startups too, right? So you have you have all these founders who are uh, you know uh, producing really high quality stuff, and they're really pushing the limits of what could be done. So yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's a competitive place today. What do you do when you have people who are doing just a good job? 
right? Like you need to have excellence in this hyper competitive space. Are, but it's is this is this about your philosophy of only hiring excellent people here? Well, I remember I'm, we we talked about we this debated at about this, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I'm so I'm sort of wondering. I, I've been working on this theme so, for a while, and I'm interested to hear from other entrepreneurs. Because I, I feel like we've probably yeah. paralleled a lot in our careers mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, and I'm really interested in your take on it, because you probably do have sometimes okay or good people in a company. It's very hard to fire somebody who's doing a good, an okay job. It's very hard to fire somebody doing a good job. Mm-hmm. It feels almost un-American in a way. Well, well I think, um, I mean, there, there's or more unfair. than just how, how high quality the, the work is of the, the employer, mm-hmm. right? It's also... Um, I mean, people who have the right motivations and are a good culture fit, that's extremely valuable, right? Because it's, that is it's about the team uh, more than anything, right? And, and if, um, if, if people are adding value to the team and contributing to the culture, I mean, that, that also goes a long so way. So good too. contributor in terms of product, but excellent contributor in getting people motivated to come into work every day and mm-hmm. solve problems yeah. equals excellent. Yeah, and I mean, there's all sorts of different skills people bring to yeah. the company, right? And, yeah. and it's it's everybody compliments each other in their own way. Yeah. Uh, so what's next? What's next? Uh, well, I mean, I think we just have a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. We're gonna, uh, you know, we're we're profitable now, and I think we just still have a long ways to go in terms of. You guys did tip over to profitability. Yeah. We are, yeah. So, um, huh. what's but that I think like for a still, company? Do you uh, pop a champagne not, bottle or? Uh, I, I think it was just a normal day for us. I mean, yeah. we, uh, um, I mean, we still have a long ways to go. I think, and um, you know, I mean, we want to uh, make a lot more money for the people using our site and grow our revenue quite a bit more. So, um, so it didn't, it didn't feel like that that big of a of a day for us. Um, but it definitely, it's it's nice to know that you don't have to, you know, worry about running out of money or have to raise more money. Right. And you guys raised about twenty five million, I think, in three rounds. About that. Yeah. With amazing investors, huh? It's been good. Charles yeah. River, and Mark Red Andreessen, Point. Red Point. Yeah. I mean, this is a great. And David Sachs, Sachs yeah. is on your board. He's on and our he, board, yeah. One of your original angel investors. Yeah. How's he been? I mean, big success He's, this week for him. Yeah, no, David. David's amazing. He's been one of the best advisors I've had, for sure. Did you think Yammer, when you first saw it, would, in four years, have a billion-dollar exit? Could you ever uh, have conceived of that? Or? I, I'd say so, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I generally remain pretty optimistic about, yeah. about all companies early on. It's a pretty amazing outcome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, Dave, Dave's done a great job. I yeah. mean, he's he's a very sharp guy. Um, you know, the lesson I learned is to always listen to what David says. Whenever I decide to not do what David says, I'm I'm always what is it about David wrong. that makes him uh, such an awesome entrepreneur and a good mentor? Apparently, um, I think he's uh, he's a very um, he's he's just, he's very clear thinker and very thoughtful. Um, and uh, he he also he's uh, he when you he say seems f- to always. This feels like direct. Uh, what, what? What are you trying to say? Like he's a very direct guy. I guess he's direct. Yeah, he's. Um, I think uh, he's. He thinks things through well. You know, he he doesn't he, he doesn't just kind of give a bunch of advice that isn't well thought through. So right. he's a know, good strategist, maybe. He, he's a good strategist. That's another way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's a great product person. He's really good at sitting down, looking at your product, and giving you advice on how to improve it. Yeah. Um, he's good at strategy, and he um, he seems to to you know push through when times get tough. I, I I know that he had at points in the past some trouble raising money for Yammer. Yeah. And uh, you know he just yeah there you know he managed to get by and ultimately create a huge success. Yammer was derided as the winner of TechCrunch 50 of the year. It won, and people thought this is just a Twitter knockoff. Yeah. And yeah. boy, did yeah. he prove them wrong! Huh? Yeah, and then and then in, and then I know that around 2008, when there was a, it was a difficult financial crisis, cri- financial think, crisis, I think yeah. he was having some trouble, and then and then George Zachary from CRV right. um, made the investment, and it worked out quite well. So you share that investor? How's George Zachary been as an investor? Uh, well, Bill Ty is actually. Oh, Bill Ty, but I yeah. do know George. Yeah. Quite well. How has CRV as a unit and Bill as an individual and George? They've been they've been great. I mean, you know these guys too, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, they've been terrific investors. They're yeah. very supportive and and have been there for us. What do you look to for the from the VCs? I mean, obviously they write a big check, mm-hmm. but do you need them? You know, a lot of say as an entrepreneur, um, and, and should entrepreneurs be looking to them for something other than the money? You know, what should we be looking for as a young entrepreneur who raises money? Obviously, you need to get that money in. That's the first step, but. Yeah. What are you looking for in the individual? What do you look well, for? Well, I think um, 
I, I think simply having some support is really helpful, right? Because, yeah. uh, you know, as we talked about before, it's kind of lonely when you're an entrepreneur. And having yeah. people around you who have seen the ups and downs of startups before, who can kind of can, can be there to support you, I think is important. Yeah. Hmm. When you took them as VCs, when you took their investment, mm-hmm. were you that discerning? Were you, or were you just happy to find somebody who wanted to invest <laughs> in your product? Were you yeah, really well, thinking we, like, yeah. wow, I wonder if these people are going to be supportive down the road? And if so, how did you qualify that? So I, I think it's just like any relationship. You do reference checks. And, yeah. um, you know, we, we actually... So you call up the we, other entrepreneurs who had them as investors? Yeah, we, we did reference checks. So yeah. that, that helped quite a bit. Now, and, that turned um, out well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. So, yeah, it went quite well. Um, continued success with the project. And, well, thank you. And uh, congratulations on um, just reaching this level where you can actually, I, I think it's really a great turning point to be thinking about the content producers and really how to make them a lot of money. That's like always a, yeah. a great moment for a business. How do we make those that group of people yeah. a better living? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we really enjoy what we're doing and we, we think we're, we're doing good things for our users and for the world. So we still have a long ways to go. And uh, what are your thoughts on, in closing, where Y Combinator has gotten to to circle all the way back. I mean, you uh-huh. see 80 people coming out of a class, and mm-hmm. the quality is extraordinary. It's gone up a lot, yeah. Um, what do you think? I mean, the, the, I guess the critique people make is too many companies. Mm-hmm. But when I look at each individual one, I see higher quality every year. Yep. So is that just – is that a real issue? They're doing too much? But if it's all high quality, why does it matter if it's too much? Is that a, a real issue, you think, or no? Um, no, I, I think it's a it's a good thing. Um, I, I, I think that that there's there's a little bit of a shift happening in the world. There's probably a bigger long term trend. There's something I've heard Paul talk about, which is that companies are going to get smaller over time. So I think with with all of these startups, you're you're just seeing um, a bit of a shift to there being more smaller companies where uh, where people you know can can found the company and own the company um, than than there were in the past where these really large um, large corporations. Yeah. Um, so I think you're just seeing a little bit of that shift happening, and um, and it's great that people all have a shot to give it a try. Smaller, but sustainable companies. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. On that, uh, thank you, Trip, for coming on the program. Everybody, thank you. follow at Scribd, uh, S C R I B D, no E in there. At Scribd and check out Scribd. Com. And if somebody wanted to come work for you uh, and they were a brilliant developer, designer, UX person, I suppose that your first name at Scribd.com might make its way to your email box with their resume. That would, that would work. We are hiring. so I always leave that to the end. Then if people really follow the interview to the end and they're an awesome developer, I can tell you, uh, great entrepreneur and I know a great company to work at with great investors. Uh, continued success. We'll see you next time. Thank you so Cheers. much.